Welcome to Multibody Dynamics B 2022-2023. We're in lesson 15 and we're going to talk today about Lagrange's method to forming the equations of motion of a multibody system. So, so far you've learned Keynes equations and how to model and simulate a multibody system. You've also seen a bit Newton-Euler's equations and you should have seen that too in a prerequisite course. Uh, those are two ways to get to the equations of motion. Um, another one um, created by Lagrange, um, not long after uh, Newton himself, uh, provides a way to get to the equations of motion by thinking about the system in terms of its kinetic and potential energy. Um, it has some connections to Keynes equations. Generalized forces are similar. We both we work with generalized coordinates in the same way. Um, but in this case, we will uh, use energy equations to get to the equations of motion. So uh, let's get into this. Here's my Wacom. Right. So we're going to look at Lagrange's equations. I'm not going to go into great depth here um, to give the background, but we're going to show you what they look like, how to use them, and give them a little bit of connection to what you've learned about Keynes equations. There's more in the online book, which you can uh, read and uh, try out some of the other examples, and then you'll get to try this out in the last homework also. So the first key thing is that um, Lagrange came up with this thing called the Lagrangian, which we'll use the symbol L for, and it is the total potential uh, kinetic energy of a multibody system minus the potential energy of that system. So, total, and I think I said that wrong, but it's the total kinetic energy and the total potential energy, which you've learned how to calculate in the prior chapter. If you have those, you can formulate this Lagrangian. And Lagrange um, discovered some very elegant, nice equations that get us directly to the equations of motion from this Lagrangian and this expression of the kinetic potential energies. And recall too that there's no accelerations that we've had to write here. Kinetic energy is a function of the velocities of the system and potential the positions of the system. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the, the simplest case here is that if we only have conservative forces in the system. Lagrange showed us that the Newton Euler equations of a system. Um, defined by n generalized coordinates q1 through qn um, can be found Of these equations. New page. Um, so his equation is that the time derivative of the partial velocity of the Lagrangian with respect to the 
time derivatives of the generalized coordinate minus the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the coordinate itself equal to zero and you get a single equation for each generalized coordinate so for r equals one to n um, we have Lagrange's equations of motion here okay? so this is the same result we've gotten from Keynes equations and, and newton euler equations if we can properly form l and then we can take these derivatives um, we get the equations of motion, in this case, of a conservative system. So I've left this zero for now. Um, you may have non-conservative forces that appear here, but uh, I'll leave that to the book for you to read a bit more about. But the key thing is that uh, here, to connect back to what we've done, um, these map to um, gains fr star, right? So you'll see that we'll take the time derivative of of these QR dots, we'll get QR double dots, we'll have the accelerations in the equation there, and then this term um, maps to the uh, FR that we've already developed, but only the conservative parts. And those are, like we've seen, um, gravitational fields, potential energy from a spring, these things that are only a function of, of, of position and, and the work done if you end up back in the same spot zero so so the, only the conservative parts all the non-conservative portions will be also added as general can be added as generalized forces on this side and and they're equivalent to what we've seen in uh, Keynes equations right this is the equation we're going to form um the this is I can spell this name right. Oh, I did. Lagrange's equation of the second kind. Right. So, um, that's great. We're going to form that. I'll do that uh, for an example problem. But this... Um, does not deal with constraints. We don't use a similar method in Keynes method to uh, deal with the constraints or eliminate them by solving for dependent speeds. Um, but there is a uh, nice way to deal with constraints also. Here, um, there's trade-offs on what we've learned with Keynes method and, uh, uh, and this method, but um, both are uh, equally useful and uh, can give you different numbers of equations and lengths of equations and have some advantages computationally, but uh, fundamentally they're equivalent. So if you recall, like say we have a non-holonomic constraint, those are going to be functions of generalized speeds, in this case q dot, and I guess I didn't say this, but we're always going to assume that um, Q dot equals U, Lagrange's approach. We're not going to use any uh, unique definitions of the U's, and uh, and then we just don't use the U when we formulate equations. We're just going to write them all in terms of Q's, Q dots, and Q double dots. The constraint equations for a non homonomic constraint take this form, and as you recall, they are also linear in the Q dots. And you can write an equation that looks like this. All right, so that comes in that form. We have some matrix multiplied by all the Q dots. And so the Q, it's linear in the Q dots and then whatever's left with the Qs, right? So it turns out that um, you can extend the mass matrix that we've already come up with. So once you formulate Lagrange's equations, if you recall, we get this uh, form of the equations, and I usually have a u dot here, but we can also use q double dot if uh, q dot equals u, um, plus some uh, 
uh, gd cube dot cube d zero. Okay. So these are once again our dynamical differential equations. And in this case, we have a motion constraint. And they, they can be non-holonomic constraints, or you could arrive at this motion constraint, which is the time derivative of a holonomic constraint. Um, so now, to form the equations of motion, we can write these in matrix form. Right, it's going to be some MD times our Q double dot. And we're going to augment these. So I'm going to make bigger set here times that equals uh, whatever's on the right hand side and then we know that we have a minus gd here yeah. well this equation um, it turns out that you can add the constraint forces to our dynamical difference equations note that with the generalized coordinate method you eliminate constraint forces but we're going to effectively add them back in and to do so um, we take this m h n zero matrix here and uh, and then m h n transposed and then we introduce these new variables which i'm going to call lambda and then um, we also have a term over here which I'll call uh, I don't have my notation quite like I want it but um, let's call this um, G uh, I'm just going to use G lambda here oh, yeah so I don't have to introduce some new new pieces. But we basically have these equations, and if I write them, them out, we've got something like this. Right, we have our dynamical differential equations times the Q double dots. But now we have this new term, which is the MHN transpose times this vector lambda, and then uh, plus the GD that we have before. And then the other equation that's left there is M H N Q double dot plus, and I call it G lambda in this case. Those are vectors. All right, so we've got these two equations and we've augmented our dynamical difference equations with this term here. So this term actually represents the constraint um, generalized forces. And then this equation here is the time derivative of the motion constraints. So with these, we've now coupled these equations through the Q double dot, and um, these constraint forces are realized because we're going to simultaneously enforce this acceleration level constraint. Right. This lambda term is a vector of lambdas, and these are called um, Lagrange multipliers. And the Lagrange multipliers turn out to be uh, the measure numbers of constraint forces and torques um, acting on the system. And these are the non-contributing forces, right?
So non contributor. So in this formulation, we can simultaneously solve for these lambdas that ensures that our constraint equation is valid, and then it will add in those constraint forces to our dynamic equations uh, such that the, the motion of the system can't deviate from whatever the motion constraints that we've kinematic and kinematic constraints that we've set, right? All right, so that's the basic gist but what we're going to try to do is formulate this set of equations here for a uh, a simple system. And you also get to do one of those in your homework. So the system that I want to introduce here is... Oh, yeah, I have a video. I want to go. I can find my mouse. So let's go to... Here, okay, so this is just a little silly um, video on uh, on YouTube here. And if I get out to 17 seconds, it's just a little homemade paper pendulum. And this pendulum has a bob at the one end here, and then it has a uh, ball that rolls back and forth in a trough that is a... Um, circular trough. So we get a basic little dynamic system. We've got uh, multiple uh, bodies. We've got, we're going to have a mass we can model as the bottom fib, and then we're going to have a rolling ball in this trough. And right? so I'm going to simplify it a bit, create a model for this, and um, and then we are going to try to model it using Lagrange's method. Okay, it's just a 2D planar system, but the things that we do uh, will apply equally to 3D. Uh, you just have to be careful when you formulate your uh, kinetic energies and potential energies that you manage your 3D system correctly. All right, so let's draw like this. I'm going to make our trough here, and then I will attach a arm I'm going to put a bob on the end of this so we've got one mass that we'll put here and then we'll have this uh, ball it's too thick we'll have a ball right that rolls and we're going to make it roll without slip so that we have a constraint inside of this trough the uh, we'll have a anchor point right here and I'll draw a little pivot right that's sort of fixed and we're going to consider the trough and the arm massless I'm just going to consider the mass of this ball we'll consider the mass of the um, of the bob and then we'll consider the mass of the ball and its rotational inertia so we get uh, a few interesting elements here and um, let's label a few points then. So we're going to call this Bob point P, uh, the center of the ball is going to be point Q. And then I'm going to have a center of our trough up here and call that point, uh, S I believe. Put it on my drawing, and we'll call the anchor point here the pivot point point O. Now, the contact point we'll label it as R. Right? So those are the points of interest here. This thing will be able to rotate in this plane about point O back and forth, and the ball goes in the trough. Let's give it some coordinates that are useful. Um, Use color here and 
So we'll need a coordinate that is going to tell us the vertical angle of um, the arm with the bob on it. I'm going to call that Q1. And then I'll also set up a I'm draw a line through the center of the ball to the center of the uh, circular trough. And then add a reference line here that's uh, collinear with the arm that has the bob on it. And then I'm going to give this angle here, we call that Q2, is our second coordinate. So that locates the, the ball in the trough. Now the ball can also spin, right? It can rotate. So we're going to give um, an angle Q3. It'll give the spin of the ball. And it's a little small here, so I think I'll leave, leave that off. I'll just note that here. Q3 is the uh, spin angle of the ball. Right. Okay, uh, we're also going to have gravity. Right. So gravity will act in this direction, and then let's sort of set up some coordinates. So I'm going to have a nx and an ny. That'll be our inertial reference frame. Gravity is pointing in the negative in y direction. And then I'll add some um, frames here. So we first do the rotation of the large portion of the pendulum. And that's going to make uh, give us these two unit vectors. We'll call this reference frame A. So we'll get an AX and an AY. Then um, I'm going to add a B reference frame that's attached to this green line that connects the center of the trough to the center of the ball. Use orange. So this will be BY and that one will be BX, right? And then lastly, I'll have um, a C reference frame that'll be glued to the ball, and that'll track the spin angle of the ball. And I think we can reasonably add that. So if I glue this to the ball, I rotate a bit more. Uh, oops. Yeah, nah, let me do that's about, about right. And then we'll get these two. So that'll be CX and CY. So these reference frames will be useful. We need a few dimensions also. Let me use one more color. I used them all. No. So the length of the pendulum here is going to be L. And we need a radius of the trough. I'm going to call that RP. We need a radius of the ball. Call that RB. And what else do you need to know here? Um, for potential energy's sake, I think that's all. One more in geometry that we, we're going to use two more pieces of geometry. Um, let me use this black again. Uh, and dotted line. So if we set Q1 to 0, this will travel back here. And I'm going to pick a reference line 
that's at the bottom state of this bob, right? And we're going to measure the height of the bob from this line, right? That's one mass, and also the height of the mass center of the ball from this line. And we're going to use that to help us get our potential energies. And I'll call um, these will be. I'm going to call that H. P for the height there. And then similarly for the ball, which is this, we'll have a HB. That'll come to that reference. So that's going to give us the height above some reference for both of the masses that are in the system. Um, we'll have uh, the mass of the ball, the mass of um, this point P, Bob. And we also will have an inertia of that rolling ball in the trough, but that'll be one half the mass of the ball times the radius of the ball squared. Just the, of a simple disk. Okay, I think those are the pieces. We won't have any friction in here. There's no springs, but we do have a conservative force that's going to act on the system, which is the force due to gravity on both of the ball and the bob. And then other than that, we need to figure out now the kinetic and potential energies of the system. Okay. So let's do that. Um, first, the kinetic energy. We've got two mass centers and one rotating piece, so we're going to need three parts to this. Right? The kinetic energy is going to be one half the mass of this particle P, uh, at P, so the mass of the bob, and that's going to be the magnitude of the velocity of P in N squared. And so that's the first piece. And then we're going to have a similar piece for the ball, right? So the mass center of the ball, we need the velocity of that. So it'll be the mass of the ball, and that's point Q we're tracking square that, that gives us the translational velocity, or the translational kinetic energy of the ball, and then we need a term that, in our case, will be the rotational kinetic energy of this ball. Since this is planar, we have this uh, reduces to simply IC times the angular velocity of C in N squared. Okay? So in the book, you'll see that for 3D systems, you better not use these equations. Uh, to be the most simplest form, especially the rotational one. It's going to be the angular velocity dotted with the inertia dyadic dotted with the angular velocity. You see that I'm blocking some of this. But that's the kinetic energy of the system. We, we've got to write those out. We just write velocities and angular velocities, and we should be able to calculate those scalar um, kinetic energy function. Right? Potential energy. Um, sorry, V is going to be uh, the mass of the bob at P times gravity times some height above this reference. We use HP. And then we add in also for the ball, HP. So that's going to be our total position energy. We have no other springs, no other um, gravitational force fields or other, anything else two uh, gravitational potentials. And then we need to figure out how to get HP and HB. Um, I'll just write HP here. So HP will look like uh, L in Y minus L A Y, all dotted with N Y. So if I draw the vector from this bottom point to P and project it back into the dotted vertical green line, I can get that height. And then you can do the same thing here. If I take a vector from here to here, and then back out to Q, I can get that too. So we'll do HB equals, um, we go up L in the, oops, not negative, 
L in the NY direction. And then I'll just add plus the vector from O to Q. If I dot all that with NY, I should get HB2, I believe. So we have those pieces. We need to work out the velocities and angular velocities of the system, but I'll do that um, in a Jupyter notebook. But this is the basic system. We get our kinetic potential, and then we're going to write Lagrange's equation and see if we get um, something that looks like equations of motion of the system. All right, so let's switch over to Jupyter notebook. Go with that. Do our standard imports. And I'll do any NV printing. So we're just going to create some coordinates Q1, Q2, Q3. And they will be dynamic symbols as usual, functions of time. We're going to need, um, and then I'll group those all into a Q, sim dot matrix, uh, Q1, Q2, Q3. And we're going to need some, all of these symbols for the different constants. So we've got the mass of the ball, the mass of the bob. We've got L, the length of the pendulum. We've got um, RP and RB, the radius of the trough and the radius of the ball. We're going to have acceleration due to gravity. And I think that's all of the symbols. Generate those. And some reference frames. So we'll do N A B C equals SM dot symbols N A B C class equals M A dot reference frame. Also want to create all these points. We've got O B U R S be useful to us. E U R S. They will be points. And we have simple rotations, so we can set up the angular velocities of these uh, body, uh, these reference frames, and then and then uh, eventually the body of C. So if I uh, do um, a dot orient axis with respect to n through q1 about the nz b dot orient axis with respect to a q2 um, a z and then c dot orient axis with respect to b through q3 the spin angle uh, b z so simple planar rotations do those. Um, now we need to set up some positions, right, from all these points. P that's set position with respect to O is going to be minus L times AY. And then we'll do S dot set position with respect to O. It's going to be the radius RP of the trough times positive AY. Takes us up to S. And then um, from S down to Q, Q dot set position from S. Uh, this is going to be the radius of the trough minus the radius of the ball. So we've got the radius of the trough minus the radius of the ball 
it's in the um, negative my direction now. So we got by, and we need x for the negative sign. I believe. Yeah. Lastly, um, that point R, right, is always in contact with the trough. Is the point fixed at an instantaneous in an instantaneous time uh, on the disk, right? And it's always at, at the point that's in contact at that at that given time. So we can set that position too. R from Q is always in the negative by direction. And the R and it's like R B. All right, so I think that sets up all of our points that we're going to need. Recall we need angular velocity of C, which is already available to us if we just call angle in in. Okay, pretty simple. Q1 plus Q Q1 dot plus Q2 dot plus Q3 dot in this case. We're gonna uh, we get the magnitude of that. We'll be fine for getting our rotational kinetic energy, and then for the linear kinetic energy, we need the um, linear velocities of both p and q. We can make use of the two-point theorem there. So I can do p um, the two-point theory uh, with respect to O. They're both points fixed in the same reference frame. In our case, A. We want it in the end frame. And that should give us value. I think I typed this backwards, right? It's supposed to be A coming in. Oh, I haven't set the velocity of zero. Let's start of O. So O dot set block vel in N of zero. That's what I was missing. So we set the velocity zero of O, and then we can do V2 theory. With respect to O, they're both fixed in A. And then I think I do, is it N comma A? Yeah, there we go. And then we can similarly do S. S is also uh, with O fixed in A. So it's the same thing. S dot the two-point theory O in A. And oh yeah, I kind of made these symbols a little nicer let me put underscores Oops. there we go now we need q q and s are both fixed in b so q dot b2 point theory with respect to q in B. And that should give us the linear velocity of Q. Is which I so we have linear velocity of P, linear velocity of Q, uh, which are the two pieces that we need up there in the, uh, just above my head, you can see. We're going to have to get the magnitudes of those. And we'll have to form um, the potential energy too. But let's do kinetic energy first. So I think we have enough for that. Our kinetic energy term, we're going to have uh, the mass of the bob P divided by 2 times the easy way to do this and, and correct for 2D, 3D. It's not to take the magnitude, but just to dot the velocity. So P dot velocity in with itself. And that gives us the squared magnitude. Now just take a look at that. We add in the next. So we get what we expect, right? So it's the linear velocity squared times the mass over 2. So we're going to do that now for the ball. Should be quite the same. So mb divided by 2 times me dot Q, velocity in N, dotted with itself, Q dot velocity in N. And we, and we get that term. 
So that's a little more complicated, but Senpai handles that just fine for us. And then we need the rotational energy term. So add that. Recall that IC is going to be the mass of the ball divided by 2 uh, times the radius of the ball squared. Right, so that's the rotational inertia of a basic disk. And then we can do IC divided by 2 times the um, same thing. We've got a planar system um, in this case. So we can do C dot ping well in in. Make sure in the homeworks for the 3D systems to use the full correct 3D equation here. The one I'm typing right now will not work for that system or a 3D system. Okay, so I think we have our potential, so I'm sorry, kinetic energy for the system. We've got a particle and then one rigid body here. And if I've typed everything right, which I haven't, that's C and N. We should get what looks like the squared magnitudes of the linear and angular velocities multiplied by either the mass over 2 or the uh, moment of inertia of the ball of 2. Okay, pretty straightforward. Potential energy. In this case, we want to formulate those uh, H, P, and H, uh, V. So we should be able to write those almost identically. Um, I'll do H, P first. And uh, we had uh, L times N dot Y minus L times A dot Y. And then we're going to dot all of that with n dot y just to get the vertical component. And we should get a, a result here. We can do a quick check. If q1 is 0, we would expect this to be 0. So I can try subs q1 0. Good. HP subs if q1 is 90 degrees, we would expect to have a height of L from this reference. Let's just try that. SM dot pi over 2. And we get L. So it seems to make sense. Um, positive potential energy when it's above the reference and then it'd be low, below if it would be negative if it was below the reference. All right, HB is going to be um, L times N dot Y plus um, Q deposition from O and all that dotted with n dot y HB lowercase L okay we can check some things here too if I subs in um, let's just say that the Bob is, or the main part is Q1 equals to zero and if I have uh, Q2 also equal to zero we should have a distance of L plus the radius of the ball does that work out good and then subs we can check if uh, Q1 is 0, and then Q2 is at 90. We should have L plus the radius of the trough, P, RP. All right, looks like we're good. So I think we've got our heights correct for the potential energy. And then we can form our potential energy of these two pieces. So we're going to have the mass of the bob times G times the height of the bob plus the mass of the ball times g times the height of the ball. And that should give our 
potential energy terms for the system. We now have kinetic and potential energy. So we can form the Lagrangian and then Lagrange equations. Lagrangian L is K minus V, simple as that. So we have um, potential uh, kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Now we're going to form the Lagrange equations. So we have three coordinates here. And remember, we still have a constraint to add, but we're going to add that at the end this time uh, using the constraints, uh, the constraint method. So we have three coordinates. That means we're going to get three Lagrange equations. So for each coordinate, we formulate a Lagrange equation. I'm going to do these manually. In the book, you're going to find some quick ways to do these using a Jacobian and matrix um, algebra. But I'll, I'll just do each equation separately. We'll put them together, and we should have our uh, equations in motion at that point. So let me, let's me let look back at what I wrote to see what does a Lagrange equation look like. So we have to take the partial velocity of the Lagrangian with respect to qr dot, whatever, q1, q2, q3 dot. And then we take the time derivative of that expression. And then we subtract from that the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the coordinate itself. And then we do it for each of the coordinates. We have 3, n equals 3. So we'll, we'll form those equations. I'll call these equations the left-hand side of that. Um, F1, F2, and F3, lowercase. So similar to Keynes, Keynes equations in that sense. So F1 is going to be partial of L. And remember, partial of Q1 dot. So the diff of T here, diff, I'll just diff is fine. Let's bring in T just so that's explicit so I'm going to do t equals me dynamic symbols dot t to, to grab the default t and then we'll differentiate with respect to t there so that gives me the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q1 dot and let's just look what that looks like we can look at it in steps there we go right Non, non-trivial necessarily and then you have to take the time derivative of that so then we do diff of t and that gives us the first term in Lagrange's equation of the second kind and you see now we have q1 double dots q2 double dots q3 double dots we've gone from velocities now up to accelerations we have um, the Taking back to Keynes method, the FR star term. This is FR star for that first coordinate in an unconstrained system. Now we're going to add in this term for all the conservative forces. Okay, so that's just L dot partial derivative with respect to Q1, and that um, gives us the first equation of motion of the three that we're going to have, and it contains the gravitational effect of the forces from this term, and then all of the dynamic forces here, whether you have centripetal accelerations, uh, uh, the contributive forces, Coriolis type of forces, tangential accelerations, all of those are going to be present in, in this portion. So we follow suit, and all we need are changing the coordinates. We have to do one for each coordinate. So it's pretty straightforward. We get our F2. And we then get our F3. So here we go. We've got our equations of motion of the system without constraining, constraining that ball to roll without slip in the trough. Okay. So what, how do we work with them? Well, recall that, um, you know, we've got the Q double dots that are all present. Equations of motion are linear in the Q double dots in the accelerations. So we can extract our MD 
by well, first let's create um, f which holds all those equations into a column vector f f1 f2 f3 and then if i um take the derivative of f or the jacobian of f now with respect to all of the q double dots so i'll do q dot diff the second the second derivative i should extract all of the linear coefficients of the q double dot terms so here's our, ma our mass matrix it uh has all the terms there and it's symmetric you can see right which is expected and this is the mass matrix of, of that system unconstrained and then the remainder part gd is whatever's left so f dot x replace i then need to substitute q1 dot diff I need to substitute zeros for each of the cord of the accelerations. U2 dot diff T2 zero and U3 dot diff T2 zero. I believe that's correct, and then we'll look at it to make sure. So we shouldn't see any Q double dots in these equations, but we can see Q dots, right? the uh, speeds, and we can see Qs, of course. So these are the equations of motion of the system that we just looked at this, this pendulum. Now, uh, this would let the ball both slide on the trough and uh, rotate, but since there's no friction currently between the trough, it would just act like a, a mass. We wouldn't get any rotational effects here. Um, if we want this rotation of x, we can add friction between the ball and the trough, or we can make a, a non-holonomic constraint there. And in this case, it should reduce to a holonomic constraint, right? Just a simple rolling disk on this trough. And um, we can do that by introducing a constraint. Uh, all right, so the constraint... What did I write? Any information about the constraint? Oh, yeah. So we want to look at this ball in the draw. Picture. Here we go. So the ball C rolls without slip on the trough. And the trough is the uh, A rigid body, the A-frame. So if we were standing in the trough, looking at the ball, and watching that contact point, then the velocity, that contact point, in A should be zero. It's not in in this case, because it's rolling on this moving thing. So if we calculate the velocity of the point R in A, and set that equal to zero, we should have a motion constraint there that would keep us from rolling without slip, right? Or keep us rolling with slip. So let's do that. So we need the velocity of R in A. And I think since we've got R dot position from uh, all the positions established, I think we're good, right? So we have a position. We know that R and Q are both fixed in the disk C. So I think we can use the, the velocity, two-point velocity theorem to get this equation, this speed that we want to be zero, right? So if I do the two-point theory, or the Q, right, they're both fixed in the body C. Um, in what order do we do this? Always forget. So we want to do in the velocity, uh, we want the velocity in the A frame, and then they share a row fixed in C. So we'll do A comma C. That should give us 
something. I get error. Velocity of point Q has not been defined in the reference frame A. Well, Q um, does move in A, so we better calculate that. <laughs> we know that um, the velocity of O in A is zero, and then we know that S and O are both in A, and S and Q are both in B. So we should be able to do, um, we might have to walk through this completely. So O dot set velocity and A is zero, and then S dot V two point theory, uh, rather to O, we want the velocity in A, and they are both fixed in A. So they don't, so the velocity of S in A is zero too, right? So let's just do that simply. Velocity in A is zero, and then um, Q, V2 point theory with respect to S, we want the velocity in A, and it is, um, they both are fixed in B. I think that'll get us to where we want. All right. So now we have the velocity of point R, the contact point, in the reference frame A, and that should be zero. So we can make our velocity constraint here. I'm going to call it the slip velocity, slip speed. Since we'll do that, I'm going to dot it. It's always in the B, X direction. And we'll just do dot B, X. And this is our motion constraint equal to zero. We need this, this expression to be equal to zero. Yeah. Okay. So there's a few ways you can get a hold of this new matrix. And I'll remind you what that looks like. So we, we want this MHN, which is the Jacobian of this equation with respect to all of the Q dots, right? And then the G lambda, I should have had bars over these, the G lambda is the right hand side of the time derivative of these equations and I'll the way I will approach this is I'm just going to um, take the time derivative of the slip speed so I'm going to say uh, slip speed dot diff t all right so that is our acceleration level constraint. I'm just going to call it C, put it in a matrix so we can do matrix operations with it. It's only a single equation, but we still like to take the Jacobian and such. Okay, so that's the time derivative of that motion constraint. And then finally, we will um, calculate this MHN and the G uh, lambda term so we can formulate this whole equation. So we'll do C dot Jacobian of Q dot diff, right? So we get off the linear coefficients of the Q double dots, and that will be our MHN. You see that it's a one by three. You have a, a column there for each of the Q double dots. And then we have a single row that we're going to be adding to uh, the equations. We're going to also use MHN.transpose for that upper right block. 
And so we need three equations to give us the three constraint forces added into our dynamic equations. And then to get um, the G lambda, G lamb, we can do a C dot X replace. Q1 uh, diff T2. I think I've typed that already, so why don't I just steal that right here? And use that same, we just set all the Q double dots to zero, that'll give us the remainder. G lamb. Which doesn't look right. I guess in this case, in this case it is. Not what I got before. Oh yeah, sorry. In this case, we don't have any extra terms, so it's going to be zero. That's fine. The constraint only has terms in here in the Q double dots. You may have terms here once you do that uh, left hand constraint, and they'll go on the right hand side of this. So now let's form these uh, total matrix with the Lagrange multipliers so we can see what our total system will be. If I md dot column join with mhn dot t, I can get the first row. No, it's supposed to be row join. So that takes our mass matrix and if I scroll over it adds our MHN transpose here right and then I can column join to this the MHN and row join I need one zero there to fill, so I'll do SM dot matrix zero. Let's see if that works. All right, I think we've got uh, what we want. So I have the MHN row here. And if you have more constraints, you would have more additional equations. I've got it transposed there, and then I've got zero in the bottom right. So this is our extended mass matrix that includes these new equations for the constraints and it includes the new terms for the constraint forces in the dynamic equations. And then we also need the G, uh, we'll call, let's call this MA for M all or something, you know, so that's MA. And we also need the G all, so I'll do it GA and that equals gd dot row join let's call it join um this g lamb which is just a zero and that should give us the right hand side yep for these equations so now ma and ga are these terms, right? So this is MA, and I call this GA here. Right in the book, you'll find different. There's a couple of other ways to get the uh, extra equations that you add there, but at this point, you have the constrained equations of motion of the system, and. If you simulate them, that constraint will hold. The ball will only roll uh, without slip in the trough. And um, and you have you have the equations motion. One detail, though, to keep in mind is you will have constraint drift in this case. We have only put in constraints for the accelerations level, like we twice differentiate it. Uh, configuration constraint or single differentiated whole number constraint and um, sorry motion constraint and you end up with this term in the accelerations that uh, due to numerical errors in the simulation you will that those constraints will drift apart 
So you still will need to use some kind of uh, integrator, like a differential algebraic equation integrator, where you could add the actual um, constraint equation, the original one, to make sure that that holds, and then thus its derivatives do. Uh, there's also some projection methods to ensure that these equations simulate and don't have drift. There's the Baumgartner um, projection method that you could use. But this at least gets you started. It shows you how you can generate equations of motion for a multi-body system using Lagrange's method and how you could apply constraints to that system too to get these um, extended equations of motion that include the Lagrange multipliers that you solve for simultaneously to your equations of motion. All right. So that hopefully is enough to sort of see how this is done. You've got the book with more detail, and then you also have uh, homework to try this out. And I'll post these materials.